We're ready now to look at the literary context of the Gospels. That is, we believe that God inspired these writings. We believe the message is his. But we have them in human form. Uh, perhaps it's connected with the idea that the incarnation is Jesus coming in person and living as people live. But he has left us a record the way humans make records. And so without taking anything away from the inspiration of the Bible, we're going to look at what is it about the literary structure of the Gospels that will help us to understand the message of the Gospel. In doing that, we will talk about the inspiration of Scripture and the preservation of the Scriptures, how they were transmitted, and then after we've established that understanding of the Bible as God's Word, then we'll look at the literary genre uh, that we see in Scripture and also look at the four Gospels in particular. Inspiration is the idea that what we have in the Bible was delivered by God. How that was done, uh, we can't say for sure. Uh, it, it is uh, a work of God. And so we're going to look at what the Gospels say about inspiration, uh, the rest of the Bible, and the New Testament in particular. First of all, let's start with the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. The Hebrew Scriptures do claim to record God's own word. For example, the Ten Commandments begin with the statement, God spoke all these words, saying. A clear statement claim that what follows are actually words that God spoke. It says all these words. Similarly, we read a few chapters later that Moses wrote, wrote down all the words of the Lord, assuming that uh, the Jews and later Christians through the years have kept the same records and have transmitted them faithfully. Then Moses wrote down the words of the Lord and the documents that we have preserved contain the words of the Lord that Moses wrote down. Hebrew scripture is the old. Now, when we get to the gospels, Jesus himself refers to the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, the written word, as God's own word. For instance, well, first of all, he quotes the Hebrew Scriptures frequently. I read one source that says that there are 78 times that the Gospels record that Jesus quotes from the Old Testament Scriptures. He quotes from the Pentateuch alone, that is, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, just from those books, he quotes 26 times. You can see the long list here of, of books from which Jesus quotes, and you can see that it goes from the beginning to the end. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Then again, uh, Psalms and Proverbs. Many of the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Amos, Jonah, Micah, Malachi. Significantly, Jesus often refers to these quotes in particular terms that are full of meaning. He calls them the scriptures. He calls them the word of God and the wisdom of God. So to understand Jesus, we need to understand that he refers to a written down, recorded record of things God has said and God has revealed. So Jesus himself speaks of a recorded word of God in the scriptures. The written word of God is God's own word, according to Jesus. Uh, these ancients lead to Christ. A later letter, 2 Peter, says no prophecy of scripture comes from someone own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Peter is not claiming that no one ever interpreted Scripture. Many have interpreted well and poorly. But the prophecy itself, the Scripture itself, Peter 
asserts it is people who speak from God. It is the Holy Spirit who carries them along to deliver that message. The New Testament also establishes claims to inspiration for the writings that are being created at the time that we consider the New Testament today. The Apostle Paul claims to have spoken God's own word and to have written God's own word. For example, he writes to the Thessalonians, when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. First Thessalonians is very early uh, in, in the collection of documents that became the New Testament. Paul had been in Thessalonica and he had converted people to, to Christ. And he says, in remembering their time together, that he praises them for not considering what he said ideas, thoughts, words of human origin, but truly the word of God. He later writes to the Corinthians, the things that I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. So the writers of the New Testament, Paul being an example, claim to be presenting God's own word. Peter similarly talks about what Paul wrote but notice the uh, reference to scripture in this verse. Our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks of them in these matters. Then Peter provides an aside. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction. Now notice how he ends his statement as they do the other scriptures, while allowing that it's hard to understand some things that Paul wrote. He is still including them with scriptures because he talks about people who distort the letters of Paul as they do the other scriptures. So Peter considered things written that we have in the New Testament to be scripture. How? Did God inspire scripture? Well, there's an underline there in many ways. He ultimately speaks to us through his son. The book of Hebrews starts out this way. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. You might think of prophets just as predictors of the future, but a prophet of God, the term is more broad than that. It's a spokesman for God. And the book of Hebrews starts off acknowledging that God has made many, uh, he has enabled many people to present his message in a variety of different ways. But the ultimate communication from God is Jesus Christ, who came down from heaven. So, he has used many ways of communicating his message. We would include scripture in that. But now the message is mainly through Jesus. Let's talk about how the scriptures came to be collected. As you know, the scriptures didn't just drop out and down out of heaven in one book already bound. First of all, you recognize that there is a Hebrew Bible. And there is a Christian Bible. Jews have the Tanakh, which includes the Torah, which Christians call the Old Testament. Christians include all of the Old Testament in the Bible, but Christians also include the New Testament, the Christian Bible. More particularly, the Old Testament, as we call it, we Christians, is called by many, uh, many who, uh, many Jews, is called the Tanakh, 
which is simply an acronym, T-N-K, for these words that we mentioned in passing last time. Uh, the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. The uh, Torah is what we call the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Nevi'im is the prophets, but not just in the sense that we normally think of prophets. Prophets being those who spoke throughout the history of old Israel, so much of it is, is history, as well as the prophecies that we commonly call the books of the prophets. The Ketuvim are the poetry and literary, literature expressions of old Israel, and all of this we take to be inspired in the many ways that God has spoken in times past. Now, how did we come to collect the documents that make up the Tanakh? Well, let's take it chronologically. There's debate about it, but we'll arbitrarily say that Moses wrote down the law in 1446 BC. History suggests, although the Bible doesn't claim specifically, that around a thousand years after Moses, Ezra, a priest, finalizes the Tanakh. That is, uh, he pulls together all that we consider to be uh, the uh, Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament. Sometime later than that, over a period of 50 years, from 250 to 300 uh, BC, actually that should be the other way around, uh, there were Jews who had moved to Egypt in a country where the, uh, the shared language of people of different cultures would have been Greek. They saw the need to put the Hebrew scriptures into Greek so they could be shared with Jews and others who now lived in other cultures and spoke other languages. Greek was the universal language. And so at that period, Jews in Egypt produced what we've come to call the Septuagint. LXX is the Roman numeral for 70. There's a legend that 70 people came together, went in different rooms, wrote down their translation, all came out with the same. Nobody really believes that legend that it happened that way, but that's where the name came from, and that's the name that stuck. Around 250 BC, running up until mm, somewhere from, well, up until the time of uh, the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. The group that we discussed last time, the probably the Essenes, but the Qumran community, produced what have come to be known as the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they include the passages from the Hebrew Scriptures. So coming up to the time of Christ, we do have records of people who were keeping records of the Hebrew scriptures, although we can't trace them all the way back to the very time of Moses. However, the meticulous copying and the reverence for the word among the Jews gives us every reason to believe that they have carefully kept the original documents. Beginning in we're going to call it 350 AD, Christian Bibles began to appear, that is, Christian Bibles that we still have copies of. Uh, the three most significant, and you'll see the abbreviations at the bottom of the slide, are the Codex Sinaiticus, which was found at Sinai, the Codex Vaticanus, which is housed at the Vatican, and the Codex Alexandrinus, which comes from Alexandria. All three of these old Bibles, which we can in general put around 350 after Christ, all of them include the Septuagint, which then goes back to 250 BC. Copies, extant copies in Hebrew of the Old Testament scriptures are not as ancient, that is, copies, written copies that we still have. The oldest copies written in Hebrew go back to about 600 
AD, not BC. Now, it's understood that there was so much reverence among Jews for the scriptures that when a copy got old and tattered, you wouldn't keep it. Sort of like uh, a, a custom that some honor for the American flag. Once one is tattered and beat up, you don't just throw it in the in the dumpster. You you bury it or burn it. You you uh, in a private situation. So it seems to be that Jews did not keep all tattered copies, but they very carefully copied the scriptures before they got rid of an old uh, text. So. 600 years after Christ. Some of them are nearly a thousand years after Christ, or the oldest copies we have written in Hebrew. Uh, there is, uh, from around uh, AD 1009, there is the Leningrad Codex. Guess where that was found? In Leningrad or St. Petersburg. Uh, and it seems to have um, the, the whole Old Testament in it. Uh, there is a reference there, if you ever want to look at it, uh, to a wonderful site on the Dead Sea Scrolls where you can look up uh, more particulars on that. You can actually look at some of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, the history of collecting the New Testament documents. When were they written? Well, the earliest letters of Paul, the epistles of Paul, were probably written from about 50 to 67. That would be some 20 years after the death of Christ. Sometime in that same time frame, the first three Gospels were probably written, that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, with the other epistles being written even as late as 90, and although there's much debate about it, perhaps the Gospel of John was written somewhere around 80, AD 80, perhaps as much as uh, 10 to 30 years later than the first three. There is much agreement that the book of Revelation is the last book of the New Testament to be written, and uh, those who accept it as God's inspired word written by the Apostle John that includes me, would date it somewhere around the year 90. Now, we do still have some very small fragments of very old documents. The oldest one is called the Rylands fragment. Uh, sometimes um, you might uh, see it referred to as P for papyrus, P52. And it seems to be dated as far back as 125. So that takes us within only a, a few decades of the time that the Apostle John was still alive and his contemporaries. And it's this little uh, three and a half inch piece of, of papyrus that has quotes from these verses in John 18. And it was discovered in Europe around 1920. So we have a very near to the day copy of part of the New Testament. And remember, we've already said that the uh, documents like Sinaiticus and Vaticanus go back as far as 350. So those dates are much closer to the time of the writing than the oldest extant written copies of the Old Testament. This chart may be somewhat intimidating, but let me tell you what we're uh, looking for in it. The chart is looking for how long was it between when we think something was originally written and the age of the current extant manuscripts. By extant, I mean we still have it. Let, let's take the, uh, the first one as an example. We believe that we have some writings of Caesar that would have been written from 100 to 44 BC. But the oldest copy we have is a copy from around 900 AD. So that's a thousand years between the two. 
and there are only about 10 copies that are ancient. You see similarly with Plato that 1300 years passed between the time of the oldest extant copy and when they were originally written and there's only a little over half a dozen of those. Uh, the next two there seem to be a lot of copies of relatively Aristotle and uh, Homer's Iliad. But still, there was 500 to 1500 years that passed from the time we think it was originally written to the time that the copies we have were written. Maybe 49 of them for Aristotle and over 600 copies of the Iliad. But the copies we have were written 500 years after Homer lived and wrote. You look at Herodotus, who's just considered the father of, of, of history as we know it. Uh, he wrote beginning in uh, 480 BC, but again, we don't have any copies that are older than 900 AD. So 1300 years passed, and we only have eight copies that go back to that kind of period. Now, said that in, in absolute contrast to copies of the New Testament. We've said that the New Testament documents were probably written from at the earliest 40 to the latest 95 AD. And we have a copy that goes back to 125 AD, a fragment. So if you look, the years that have elapsed from the time that it was written until from the time that it was originally written, say by John, until the time the copy we have was written is really only a few decades. And when you start talking about having original, having documents that are the originals, not just somebody's copy of somebody's copy of somebody's copy, but we have 24,000, probably more than that by now, fragments uh, and, and whole pages and whole books. We have 24,000 ancient copies of the New Testament. There's simply no comparison. It is a reliable document by any academic or historical standard. Now, having established what the Bible says about coming from God, that it is the inspired Word of God, and having looked at what inspiration means and how believers have kept the records of God's word. Now we're going to look at it as how is it written and what will we learn better by knowing how these appear to us in written form today. We're going to divide the New Testament into three different kinds of writing literature. The Gospels and Acts are largely, not entirely, but largely accounts of events that are important to the beginning of Christianity. The large middle section, uh, we'll call it briefly, the middle section of the New Testament are the epistles. The letters, some formal, some personal, that record communications mostly from Paul, but from other important uh, early spokesman of Christianity. They are letters, sometimes general teaching, sometimes uh, specific situations are addressed. They're relatively short, although some are longer than others. And then all to itself in its style is the book of Revelation. Uh, apocalyptic literature, if you've read any of it or heard anybody talk about it, you know that it's a very different kind of writing. Now, in the Bible in general, there are many different kinds of writing or accounts of how people spoke. And we see this variety in the New Testament, and particularly in the Gospels. There's sometimes narrative, and sometimes there is dialogue. Dick and Jane went up the hill. That's narrative. Dick said, see Jane, see. That's dialogue if Jane says, oh, I see, or something like that. Narrative, dialogue. There are sermons, 
that are recognized as a lesson, a religious lesson that someone gave at some particular time to some particular group. There are parables in the Gospels, uh, pretty much entirely spoken parables as part of, of oral lessons. But we also run into laws and rituals and references to laws and rituals. And sometimes those quotes are in the language of the original law, say the law of Moses, or uh, we hear a description of the rituals the way that the temple was run in that day. And yet there are also, it's easier to see in the Old Testament, like the Psalms, uh, there are writings and poetry, or, or if you think about the book of Ruth, it's a story as much as it is a, um, an expression of religious truth. There is prophecy, that is, someone who is directly speaking, God told me to say this, here's what it is, which sometimes includes predictions of future events. And then there is apocalypse, that is, taking something that's been hidden, a secret, pulling it out of the box so everybody can see what it means, but in a sense, not really, because the secret is taken out in fantasy terms, that is, fantasy like dragons and, uh, and flying through the sky and great exaggerated images, as we talked about last time, uh, apocalyptic in the sense of talking about how God's going to finally bring justice to this world in the end. We also have in the New Testament, as well as uh, particularly in the Gospels, explanations about the Hebrew Scriptures and explanations about what the New Testament teaches and claims. So you can see that if you can stop and think what kind of writing are you reading, what kind of speaking are you seeing quoted, then you can get the context of the original meaning. Now, the term that stood out in your textbook to describe the genre of the Gospels is sermonic biography. You know what biography is, you know what a sermon is. Well, this is a biography that has a strong sermon-like quality to it. John, at the end of his gospel, writes, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which aren't written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So there you have it. It's biography. This is a sampling of things that Jesus did. But it's written for a reason, to make you a believer, so that you can believe in Christ, and so that, as a believer, you can have eternal life. It's written to make you a believer that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Son of God. So the Gospels are a genre, a style of writing to themselves. It is biographical but it's also sermonic. I want us to use Matthew as an example of the literary structure of different sections or books of the Bible. Some seem to be random collections. If you looked at the book of Proverbs, you could move from one verse to the next and you completely change subjects, general wisdom. But at other times, there is a sequence, there is a theme, there is something to the structure that helps you to get the broad message of a book. And it's important to get that, if you can, before you try to get the specific meaning of a small part of that book. So I think the Gospel of Matthew is an easy example. The literary structure of Matthew is a part of the message in his gospel. Not only is the content communicating something, things he includes, things he doesn't include, but the way he arranges it tells you something about his intent when he originally wrote it, taking nothing away from the fact that God inspired it, but God is using a human 
concept of the written word. The structure is a simple one. Matthew's gospel alternates between two kinds of information, narrative and discourse. That is, he'll describe a sequence of events, then he'll stop and insert uh, a long sermon or a collection of lessons that Jesus actually said. So you'll have, if you do the little red letter Bible thing, you'll have a section with little short sayings, and then you'll have several chapters in red letters. One goal of Bible study, an important goal, is to first understand what purpose the passage served for its original readers. Yes, it's important to apply it, uh, to carefully interpret it, but to be sure that you're getting the message from the text and not from your own imagination or experience, you need to understand its original context. And as you look at Matthew, looking at the structure helps you to understand that context. He is obviously emphasizing two things. He emphasizes important facts about the life of Jesus. And he emphasizes lessons that Jesus taught. Reading Matthew with this understanding helps you to determine the meaning and the significance of the text as a, as a whole document, and then to interpret the individual parts of the whole. Here's a chart showing how Matthew is structured. There is a section that doesn't go back and forth, the birth of Jesus. That's the first couple of chapters. It's going to be the fifth chapter before you get to the Sermon on the Mount, those three chapters. Then there is a uh, mission of the Twelve. That There's a speech there in chapter 10. There's a collection of kingdom parables in chapter 13. There's a section of lessons on humility and forgiveness in chapter 18. And then near the end of Matthew, there is a series of lessons where he opposes the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and talks about the apocalyptic end that's about to be accomplished. And that's in chapters 23 through 25. So you have this one, two, three, four, five divisions where there is action between them, but these are sections of, of what Jesus said. So you go back then, after the birth of Jesus, you have these events, the baptism and temptation and beginnings of the ministry of Christ. Then you jump over to the Sermon on the Mount. You have a long section of miracles in chapters 8 and 9 before you get into a uh, speech of Jesus when he sends out the 12. You come back to action. Uh, as he's doing miracles, people are beginning to oppose him. Then you have a chapter of parables about the kingdom. Then you go back to action, more miracles, uh, significantly the transfiguration, the warnings that Jesus is about to be taken and killed and that he will rise again. In that context, there's another section of lessons on humility and forgiveness. You come back to the action where there are people questioning Jesus, where Jesus is making predictions of what will happen. There is great conflict. And then you have a long section of lessons against hypocrisy and lessons warning of the end that's coming. Back and forth and back and forth. Now, we tend to think of books as being written in chronological order. And it's not exactly not chronological, but that's not the main structure. Uh, you can figure out something about when the Sermon on the Mount occurred. But that's not entirely the point of where it lands in the book of Matthew. And the same with each of these other sets of, of, of sermons. Anyone who has uh, spoken much knows that you might repeat a lesson. You would tweak it and present it differently, but you might present a lesson more than once. And so you may find lessons of Jesus at different points in the different Gospels. Sometimes that may be because he said it again in a different context. Sometimes the Gospel writer may be gathering things together on a theme. For instance, we said chapter 18 is about humility and forgiveness. 
And so you need to look for the structure to see if there's an overall theme of the section that will help you to determine what is the significance of the teaching in that particular passage. Matthew's Gospel starts with action that doesn't lead directly to, uh, to speeches in the birth of Jesus, and it ends with the end of the life of Jesus on earth, with the interrogations of Jesus, the crucifixion, then the resurrection and the ascension. So I want you to see, although I'm not asking you to memorize it, I do want you to understand that there's a clear structure in the book of Matthew. A section of activity followed by a section of sermons, followed by a section of activity, followed by a section of sermons, and so on. That's part of understanding the Gospels, is to understand the literary structure. Now, as your book puts it, there is the Gospel, and there are the four Gospels. The Gospel is the central message, or a word that they throw out for you in the textbook is the charisma, the, the spoken message, uh, the news. Or as you know, Gospel means good news. And so there is this common message, the gospel. And yet there are four books that we call gospels. Each has unique details and different perspectives. And that's what we're going to examine now before we get deeply into any one of the books. There is common content in all four gospels. I'm going to show you. Um, a short outline, and mention it as one example, one that's kind of an outstander, it's not being in all of the Gospels. There is uh, some advantage to trying to put some chronological order to the events in the Gospels. And so there is much here that is covered by all of them, or at least the first three Gospels. The first part, of the first year that's covered, not counting the birth and childhood of Jesus, goes from Nazareth to Jerusalem to Capernaum. They include the baptism and temptation of Jesus, the calling of the first disciples. John includes here the miracle at Cana, but they all have him settling back at home in Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee. Now, we have only in John a section about a Passover visit to Jerusalem. At that time, there is an early, later repeated, cleansing of the temple. There is the discussion of Jesus with Nicodemus, the interaction between Jesus and the woman of Samaria, and some specifics of his being rejected at a synagogue in Nazareth. The reason we point out John's mention of this Passover is that although there's some debate about how to interpret all references to special days in the Gospels, John seems to clearly delineate three years, as you can tell, because Passover comes once a year. Three times it seems to be a Passover that help us to see how much of the life of Christ we're covering, probably about three years. So that's the first year. In the second year, Jesus is mostly around Capernaum in Galilee. There's more about his interactions with his disciples, about healings that he does and preaching. John tells us about some feast trip to Jerusalem, which we can guess would be Passover, where there's some healing and some teaching and some opposition in Jerusalem. But he returns to his home territory in Galilee. He goes back to his home in Capernaum, on the Sea of Galilee, where he again interacts with the apostles. It's around there and in that place that he preaches the Sermon on the Mount, and he continues to perform miracles throughout a second year of ministry. Year three has much more detail than the rest, than the first and the second year. Several feasts of the Jews are mentioned, and we know what time of year they were, so we have a pretty close chronology for these. So before the autumn, holy day, we, hear, we see Jesus coming out from Capernaum, sending out the twelve, the dramatic walking on the water and preaching that he's doing based in Capernaum. 
he takes some travels to the north and to the west of Galilee, to some non-Jewish areas, Tyre and Sidon, Bethsaida, Caesarea Philippi, and he continues doing miracles and teaching in these not-so-Jewish areas, close by, but not so Jewish. And at this period in his life, there is the transfiguration, uh, where he uh, changes in appearance before their very eyes and speaks with Moses and Elijah before his close, uh, closest apostles. And then he goes back to Galilee. So we have him still based in the north, not so much in the center of Jewish activity in Jerusalem, up to the altar. But he does go for the Feast of Tabernacles, which is, you know, the calendars are different, but around October. And we know that he goes to the Feast of Dedication, which today we call Hanukkah, which is roughly in December. He is now in Judea, Judea being the province that includes Jerusalem, the center of Jewish power and religion. And so we know what time of year it is from the autumn to the spring. He's going on different occasions to Jerusalem. He's doing miracles and the controversy is increasing. During those tense times, there are times that he goes to the east side of the Jordan River, that is, across the Great Jordan Rift over to a fairly barren area called Perea, and he preaches there. He comes back near Jerusalem to raise Lazarus from the dead in Bethany, as revealed in the Gospel of John, and then we read that he still does some preaching in Perea. So that part here. And then, of course, in the spring, in the third year, we come to another Passover, and it's his final Passover on earth. Perhaps around April, he's returning to Jerusalem. There is the triumphal entry, but there are conflicts with those in power. And then the heartbreaking week leading to the cross is interrogations, his crucifixion, and then his glorious resurrection. In presenting this information, each of the four Gospels has its unique qualities. One of the four Gospels is more different than the other three. The first three Gospels are similar, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Similar in content, similar in focus, and they are seeing the same, S-Y-N meaning uh, together, and optic meaning to see. They, are, they see it from the same perspective. So often you will hear Matthew, Mark, and Luke referred to as the synoptic gospels. But John presents a different perspective. If you'll remember from the earlier uh, part of the lesson where we talk about when the New Testament was written, John was written considerably decades later after the other Gospels. We're almost into a second generation of Christians. And John is giving some of the same information, plus a considerable amount of other information, but much more interpretation of what this account of events and speeches, what it means. He interprets events and speeches in addition to presenting information. So of the four Gospels, you have the Synoptics and you have John, and we'll study John independently of the others later. So to summarize the distinctions of the four Gospels, we have the three Synoptics that were probably written around very rough date, around the year 60, 30 years after Christ. We believe that Mark was written by a traveling companion of Paul who shows up in the book of Acts. We believe that Matt, and probably it was written first. We believe that Matthew was written by the Apostle Matthew. But we believe that Luke was written by another companion of Paul, a physician who traveled with him. And so we have of the first three Gospels only one written by an Apostle, with two others that may have had uh, less Jewish and more um, 
extended world culture in their background, possibly for Luke, not as clearly for Mark. But they're different perspectives in some senses, but, and, and by the way, many, many people believe that Mark simply was writing at the dictation of the Apostle Peter. Those three around 60. Perhaps 30-ish years later, you have this much more reflective gospel written by the Apostle John around the year A.D. 90. Now, to break them down, the perspective and the structure of the Gospel of Matthew. In perspective, Matthew's Gospel has a strong Jewish emphasis. It suggested that he is writing originally for a mixed Jewish and a Gentile readership. Much more than the others, there are 40 quotes from the Old Testament and a hundred allusions to the Old Testament. There are 14 direct statements that say that Jesus fulfills prophecy, which is significantly more than the other Gospels. John only seven times uh, has a direct statement saying Jesus fulfills prophecy. Luke only four times, Mark only twice. That's the perspective of the Gospel of Matthew. The content and structure of Matthew we've already begun to look at. There are 28 passages that are unique to Matthew, meaning Mark, Luke, and John don't give that information. And as we mentioned, it has a clear narrative discourse structure. There are five sermons or discourses that separate five sections of events or narrative. A very simple outline would be that the first four chapters introduce Jesus. The next section up to chapter 16 describes his ministry and rejection by the people. And then all of chapter 16 through 28 is about Jerusalem and the crucifixion and the resurrection. That's the skeleton of the Gospel of Matthew. Mark. There is, for perspective, a sense of urgency in presenting the Gospel. The phrase, and immediately, is used 42 times in the Gospel of Mark. Now, there's considerable speculation about what that phrase actually means. It doesn't always mean, in the very next second, this happened. Some have speculated that if this was indeed dictated by Peter, he's just saying, and then Peter said, it's hard to say, but the, it's the shortest, it moves very, very quickly, and there seems to be an immediacy of, of trying to get you to know. There's an urgent need for you to know the basic message of the gospel. Uh, it's almost a just the facts, ma'am, kind of approach. There are fewer words of Jesus in Mark than in any of the other gospels. It's interesting to speculate whether the first readers were probably mostly Jews or are not. Sometimes the writer just assumes that you would know these Jewish traditions that happen to be a part of the story. Sometimes they're explained. Now for the structure and content of the Gospel according to Mark. It's mostly about the ministry of Jesus in Galilee and then suddenly jumps to Jerusalem. It, all the Gospels are, but in particular Mark, is focused on the treatment of what happens in that last week of Jesus uh, before his crucifixion. Nearly half of Mark is about the build-up to the week of the crucifixion. Predictions of the passion of, of the mistreatment of Jesus at the end of his earthly life begin in chapter 8, right in the middle of the book. The last week of the life of Jesus begins in chapter 11 out of 16 chapters. So, the structure of Mark, which is fairly short, seems to be nine chapters on his ministry up in the north around the Sea of Galilee, his Galilean ministry. Then just a few chapters on his ministry in Judea, the province around Jerusalem, 
with a significant section on his crucifixion and his resurrection. So in its organization, in its content, in its emphasis, these are the ways that Mark is distinctive from Matthew, from Luke, and from John. Luke is a wonderfully exciting book to read. Luke had a thinking perhaps more like our Western thinking than some Jewish and other Middle Eastern and Eastern thinking. We like for things to proceed in an orderly way. And Luke says, as he begins his gospel, that he's going to give an orderly account. He gives a significant number of historical details that help us to place when these events happened. It's also important to understand that Luke also wrote Acts, and some would say, I don't know about originally, but maybe originally even published two volumes of the same work. We kind of know what Acts was uh, written for because it suddenly ends while the Apostle Paul is in prison in Rome, and it seems to be explained to someone how Paul got to this point and what Christianity was about and how it got started. And so there is an orderly account that starts with the birth of Jesus, actually with the genealogy, then the birth of Jesus, moves forward, if you go all the way through Acts, to the early days of the spread of Christianity. But it's an orderly account. Now, it is, in content, significantly different. Nearly half of the content of Luke does not appear in the other Gospels. He gives much more information about the childhood of Jesus, and he emphasizes the prominent role of women in the ministry of Jesus. Here's a simple presentation of its structure. First nine chapters would be about his public ministry, concentrates mostly on Galilee. Then there's a relatively long middle section with a lot of material that's not in the other Gospels about his ministry down there in Perea, the, uh, the province that is on the east side of the Jordan River, uh, the area where John the Baptist had been. Uh, but he goes there on his way to Jerusalem, and then as all the Gospels do, it ends with the crucifixion and the resurrection in the last several chapters. As we said, John is entirely different in perspective. It's not so much, here are the facts, like maybe Mark, but here are the facts and here are what the facts mean. Here's what Jesus said and here's the significance of his message. It is structured around an obvious theme, and that is, it is the gospel of believing. The verb believe occurs about a hundred times in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John leaves out much that was already recorded in the other Gospels. Perhaps he's quite aware that people had that information. And so conversely, it includes much that's not in the other Gospels. This is an even simpler outline than the others. Up through chapter 12, the public ministry of Christ back and forth between Jerusalem and Galilee. Then from chapter 13 all the way through 21, the passion of Christ, that is, the events leading right up to the interrogation, unfair crucifixion, burial and resurrection of Jesus, with some additional information about things that happened after the resurrection. So there you have it. As you look at the four different Gospels, there is a different perspective and a different structure. If you look at these skeleton and internal perspective concepts, it will help you to determine what the meaning of individual passages of the Gospel are about. Here's what's coming up. In our next lecture, we will look more closely at the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, we're going to give an overview of the first 20 chapters of Matthew, and in doing that, we will cover much, probably most, of the events in the life of Christ before the time of the crucifixion as we cover Matthew. 
Uh, we will emphasize events over speeches for now because we're going to have a separate section when we study the speeches in Matthew. And then uh, in the next lesson, we'll begin to add information from Mark and Luke. That's it for this presentation.